Hi, my name is uh, Alex Lazar, and I'm here on this webinar to speak to you about liquid biopsies and whether they can be used in immunotherapy. And in these are my disclosures. Most of these uh, are involved uh, in doing uh, consulting or uh, research um, uh, support with these companies. I don't think any of these are particularly directly pertinent to this presentation. There is one um, uh, potentially pertinent um, uh, disclosure, and that is that MD Anderson, who is my employer, and Garden Health have a formal strategic relationship um, involving the clinical implementation and use of liquid biopsies. However, I will not be specifically um, talking about the products from this company. So a little bit about me. I am a uh, professor of uh, pathology and genomic medicine at, uh, at MD Anderson. I did my MD and PhD degrees at UT Southwestern. Uh, I then did training in anatomic pathology with fellowships in soft tissue and dermatopathology uh, in Boston. And I have published uh, extensively on molecular diagnostics um, and multi-omic analysis of solid tumors and particularly looking at targeted and immunotherapy approaches to cancer treatment in, uh, in sarcoma and melanoma. So a roadmap for this uh, short talk uh, will be, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, immunotherapy uh, in melanoma. We'll talk about potential biomarkers that can inform the use of immunotherapy in melanoma. We'll then talk about a few general considerations about liquid biopsies, and then we'll have a discussion about whether liquid biopsies can inform or guide uh, immunotherapy decisions in, uh, in, in melanoma. So we've, we've made a, um, a fair number of, uh, of real advances in the treatment of melanoma, both with targeted therapy uh, and, with, uh, and with immunotherapies. And I think you can see on this slide that, um, you know, sort of the first approved therapy um, for, uh, for melanoma was decarbazine. Uh, the results from this weren't great. The next one actually wasn't uh, a type of immunotherapy, high-dose um, uh, interleukin-2. And then you can see um, around 2011, there was a real explosion um, of both um, immunotherapy um, and uh, BRAF and MEK inhibitors that have been applied to, uh, to, to melanoma. And very interestingly, um, not only um, uh, have these uh, have these treatments um, actually been discovered and used in melanoma, but you can see here that the survival uh, advantages, uh, at least uh, here listed on this slide, the one-year uh, survival rates for stage four uh, melanoma, which is melanoma that's um, uh, metastasized beyond the regional lymph nodes to further sites away in the body, um, have been uh, have been quite impressive with these therapies and have really improved very recently. So that with some of the some of the immunotherapies, um, particularly the combined immunotherapy, we have survival rates of, of up to 85 percent uh, at uh, at one year. So unfortunately, um, the immunotherapy does not work uh, in all patients in melanoma. We are lucky in melanoma. Um, up to 50% of patients um, uh, will respond, um, particularly to uh, anti-PD-1 um, and uh, PD-1 uh, plus um, ipamilumab uh, type of approaches. But we don't doesn't respond to everybody. So a number of factors um, have been looked at um, in order to try to predict which patients are likely to benefit from um, uh, from immunotherapy. And so approaches that have been looked at are PDL1 expression, um, the degree of CD8 um, uh, cytotoxic T cells uh, infiltrating into the cancer, uh, the clonality of those um, of those particular uh, T cells. Uh, lots of different things with the mutational um, state of the tumor, looking at the, the, the total amount of mutations, looking at uh, particular mutations in specific genes, looking at the microsatellite instability um, uh, state of the tumor um, uh, due to um, uh, DNA uh, mismatch uh, repair. Uh, and also there's uh, there's been some uh, some data showing that uh, copy number alterations uh, uh, may be uh, may affect the likelihood of response as well. In addition, a number of oncogenic pathways may make response more or less likely, uh, and these include the ERK or MAP kinase pathway, the PI3 um, uh, kinase pathway, uh, and the uh, the Wnt beta catenin pathway. 
Serum factors can also um, uh, affect the, uh, the likelihood that a patient will respond to uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, and the uh, patient's microbiome, particularly the gut microbiome, um, can, um, uh, can affect the, the likelihood that the patient or predict the patient's likelihood of response. And then when we actually employ various types of assays, maybe uh, may provide may provide make it more or less likely that we are uh, that we're able to see a difference that would be um, predictive or associated with uh, with response. Now, in, in melanoma, whether any of these are, are ready for the clinic or not, I think is a I think is a real discussion, uh, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later in this talk. Let's now discuss the immune uh, microenvironment. Uh, this is an example of, of, of pd one uh, labeling in melanoma. You can see here that a high percentage of the, uh, uh, of the melanoma uh, cells are actually showing a strong membranous uh, distribution, uh, pd one expression. And in melanoma, uh, we don't really use this necessarily to predict uh, treatment response. And so the um, expression of uh, membranous pd one in, in melanoma is uh, actually a complementary diagnostic uh, rather than a companion diagnostic, so it's not actually required to use these types of agents um, uh, in melanoma. Uh, what you can see about PDL1 uh, uh, expression from, from this um, uh, particular trial is that uh, when you have greater than 1%, which is a very small amount, uh, clearly, of expression of, of membranous uh, PDL1 in melanoma, there's no advantage to using the combination of uh, a PD-L1 inhibitor and a CTCL4 um, uh, inhibitor such as uh, uh, nivolumab and ipamilumab in this particular trial versus using a PD-1 uh, inhibitor alone. And of course, um, either the combination or the single agent um, is, is generally better than ipamilumab um, alone. But when you have less than 1% expression, uh, which is basically no pdl one expression at all, um, you can see from the graph on the right that there is a uh, distinct um, uh, advantage to using combinations of pdl one inhibitor and a CTCL4 um, uh, inhibitor um, as, as, as well over either the single agent uh, pdl one inhibitor or the single um, CTCL4 inhibitor. So the expression of this uh, can be useful um, in this particular uh, situation, uh, but this is uh, not something that's used by, uh, by all oncologists. Another predictor of the um, uh, immune uh, uh, checkpoint response is CD8-positive uh, cytotoxic T cells. There are often more of these in patients that will respond in those that, uh, as opposed to those that, that don't respond, uh, although this is not always a, a, uniform, uh, a uniform finding, uh, and we can have patients respond uh, in melanoma that have very low levels of T cells or have higher levels of, of T cells. So in this slide from the, uh, from the Melanoma um, Cancer Genome Atlas project, you can see that the number of, uh, of lymphocytic uh, infiltrates within melanoma also correlates with overall outcomes. So the more lymphocytes that you have um, resident in the tumor, the better likelihood that you are to, uh, the, better, the, the higher the likelihood that you will have a, a better outcome uh, of, your, of your case. Uh, and of course, um, in addition, we know that an increased number of uh, intratumoral lymphocytes um, is also an important uh, predictor of response to, uh, to immunotherapy. This is recent uh, work that we published um, in, uh, in cell reports um, earlier this year showing that not only the overall number of lymphocytes uh, that are present uh, uh, in uh, melanoma and other solid tumor types uh, was, was important for predicting outcome, but the distribution so that the, um, the more intense or brisk and diffuse, um, such as you see in the top of this slide, the infiltrate was, um, or the more that it surrounded the tumor itself, these outcomes were better than having smaller amounts of, of lymphocytes uh, within, the, within the tumor itself. So we'll now talk about um, various types of mutations within the, uh, with, within the, within the tumor. So another way to, um, to predict the response to immune uh, checkpoint blockade is by looking at the, um, uh, the, the total number of mutations in the tumor. And so the, uh, 
higher the number of, of, of mutations, we feel like there's probably more neoantigens um, uh, that are created and a more likelihood to have a productive uh, immune response that can be helped along um, by, the, uh, by the immunotherapy. And this has been shown in a number of different uh, systems. This is an approach uh, that we used um, looking at ways to, uh, a few years back, um, to calculate uh, total mutational burden uh, within uh, various um, uh, gene sets in order to predict response. Uh, and from um, several different clinical trials um, using uh, a bioinformatic approach, we were able to uh, use the total mutational load in, uh, in a um, uh, series of melanoma uh, and lung cancer trials and show that the um, uh, prediction of the larger number uh, of mutations correlated well with outcome. So what can be seen uh, in, in, in this slide is that um, patients that have um, higher uh, mutational, uh, mutational burden tend to have um, better overall uh, survival uh, and that these patients um, also um, had um, considerably better responses to, uh, to immunotherapy. Analyzing uh, a further cohort um, from this uh, publication uh, from uh, Science uh, Translational uh, Medicine, we were able to demonstrate that the higher the um, percentage of copy number losses that you had, the less likely you were to respond to, um, uh, to melanoma. So, the, uh, so this probably corresponds to uh, important uh, tumor suppressor uh, genes, and you can see from panel B uh, some of those that, were, uh, that are depicted um, uh, across, um, across here. Um, you particularly notice um, around chromosome 10 and the losses there that P10 is one of the genes uh, that's lost there, and we'll be talking about that again uh, in, just, uh, in, just a, in just a few moments. Uh, others, others have found that, that particular mutations um, uh, in, spe in specific genes um, can also predict response uh, to immunotherapy. So here's um, uh, particular mutations, uh, recurrent mutations in, the, in two um, uh, serpent genes um, uh, that are involved in, uh, in immune response um, strongly correlate with who will respond to uh, anti-CTCL4 um, uh, ther immunotherapy. So as, as opposed to um, just total mutational burden, uh, mutations in specific genes can also be uh, important for predicting response. And then, of course, um, uh, now we know that there is a, um, a particular, uh, particular case um, of, of having a high tumor mutational burden uh, that, that predicts response, and this is actually um, uh, FDA approved for, uh, for solid tumors um, uh, uh, in patients now. So the finding of microsatellite instability, whether it occurs in a neoplasm such as colon cancer or endometrial cancer where it happens commonly, or in other cancers where it can happen uh, very rarely, this is a, this is a strong indicator that, uh, that, predicts, um, that predicts response as well. So tumors that have microsatellite instability uh, tend to have um, a very high um, uh, mutational burdens. Now we're going to look at some uh, specific oncogenic pathways that correlate with response. So work from um, uh, Tom uh, Gajewski's group um, in Chicago has shown that um, uh, melanomas that tend to have a greater degree of uh, signaling through the Wnt pathway, which is dependent on, on beta-catenin, um, uh, tend to not have uh, as high lymphocytic infiltrate and are thus less likely to respond to uh, immunotherapy. Our group has shown that another um, onc common oncogenic pathway in melanoma, the PI3 kinase AKT pathway, uh, that the higher the uh, the higher this um, this pathway, um, that the more flux through this pathway, uh, the less likely you are to see um, lymphocytic infiltrates. And a graphic illustration of that is is shown uh, here, where you can see in the upper left hand corner uh, P10 staining with the immunohistochemical portions that are intact, and then an area where there's clonal loss um, to it right next to it, and you can see that the uh, lymphocytes that are present uh, with CD8 staining, uh, there's a fair number of lymphocytes that are present where P10 is intact, and therefore AKT, uh, PA3 kinase signaling is low, uh, whereas there are less lymphocytes where, um, uh, where the AKT, uh, PA3 kinase pathway is, is elevated. Uh, and um, 
the higher the, uh, the, the flux through this uh, PA3 kinase AKT pathway, the less likely you are to respond to, uh, to immunotherapy. There, there are also uh, serum factors that, that can predict response to immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors. These, these include um, uh, LDH. Shown in this particular uh, graph is um, response to um, dibrafenib and uh, trametinib, which is a, a BRAF mech inhibitor uh, combination. But we see the same thing with immunotherapy, that patients that have higher levels of serum LDH are less likely to respond to, to immunotherapy as well as targeted therapy. Uh, another emerging um, uh, factor for predicting uh, immune uh, checkpoint response in melanoma um, is, the, uh, is the microbiome. We now know that the, uh, the microbiome of the, of the gut of patients um, uh, with cancer can, uh, can modulate responses to therapy, and you can see um, uh, several papers um, that, that correlate particular features um, of, the, um, of the microbiome with uh, response or non-response to anti-CTCL4 or anti-PDL1 uh, therapy. So there were a series of, of three um, uh, back-to-back papers um, uh, in, uh, in science this year. I'm going to present some of the data that came from, from our group showing that uh, features of the gut microbiome uh, were associated with uh, responses to, uh, to immunotherapy uh, in, in, in patients, uh, both in melanoma and in other solid tumors as well. Our, our work uh, was, was solely with, uh, with melanoma. Uh, and so what we were able to, uh, to, to demonstrate was that responders um, had a much more diverse, uh, meaning more species uh, of, of bacteria within their microbiome, uh, whereas those with uh, less diversity um, had, um, had, less, um, uh, had less likelihood of, of, of response, as shown in the Kaplan-Meier curve in the bottom left. So this was a uh, uh, finding that um, uh, was ultimately uh, replicated where in mice we were able to show that by switching the microbiomes we could make the mice um, uh, more or less likely to respond uh, to uh, immune checkpoint therapy. This led to uh, the design of a, uh, of a clinical trial uh, where we will actually be assessing the microbiome uh, of patients, and if they have one that is predicted to be uh, of low response, uh, we will do a microbiome uh, transfer uh, to try to provide the patients with a microbiome that is more likely to be associated with, uh, with response. Uh, recently, we had a proof of principle uh, in patients that by switching the microbiome, we could actually um, uh, make a positive change. Um, so as you know, uh, as you probably know, uh, immune therapy can have a number of side effects, um, including colitis. Um, this is a patient uh, with colitis um, secondary to um, uh, being treated with a combination of um, an anti pd one and anti-CTCL4. Our combination therapy um, uh, that developed a, a colitis that was really refractory to steroids um, and anti-TNF therapy. Uh, and what we found is by um, having a, um, a fecal transplantation in this patient that provided them with a healthier microbiome uh, allowed their uh, colitis to, um, to completely resolve. So not only is the microbiome predictive of response or non-response um, in uh, melanoma patients um, treated or, or other types of cancer patients um, treated with uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, but the side effects associated with those are also modulated by the microbiome. So the, the, the cases that um, all of the factors that I've, that I've shown you um, are interesting in that they all correlate um, with um, increased likelihood of response to um, uh, immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors uh, in, in melanoma. Um, but they're not perfect predictors, and in fact, um, uh, patients that, uh, that do not have these, these features may, may respond anyway. Many of these um, uh, factors um, um, co-vary with one another, so higher mutational load is associated with uh, an increased number of uh, lymphocytic infiltrates, for instance. Um, and in fact, um, very, these, these markers, while they can enrich patients, um, uh, uh, that are likely to respond. None of them is really considered uh, good enough by, by most clinicians to use as a, as a sole indicator, so they just sort of help you decide, is this patient more or less likely to respond to immunotherapy? Um, but another factor that we can, that we can look at with this is, is, assay, is assay timing. 
so when are we when are we going to look for the biomarker? So, so if we look here at these um, uh, cases of, of melanomas uh, being um, uh, being um, looked at either prior to therapy, which is the the, the top set, the, the the panel G, where it says pretreatment, um, you can see that uh, in responders you can have some higher numbers of, of uh, lymphocytic infiltrates. I'll tell you, in many cases. Um, there's not that much in the studies that we've done. There's a lot of overlap between the responder and non-responder populations in terms of the number of uh, lymphocytes that are present or not present in their melanoma. But what we can clearly see is that in, uh, and this is very, very statistically significant, uh, that when the patients are on treatment, non-responders do not have a big influx of lymphocytes um, uh, uh, into their tumors, whereas uh, patients that, and this is in panel H, that are responding have massive influxes of, um, of, um, of T cells into their, into their tumors. So in this sense, actually um, looking at biomarkers while the patients are being treated may be much more robust than trying to use biomarkers prior to treatment. Of course, this has problems associated with it because it's sometimes difficult to, uh, to obtain this type of material. This is practical with melanoma because the patients that we were looking at uh, were patients that actually had um, uh, metastases that were in the skin that were amenable to, uh, to biopsy. And so this is sort of a sort of a cartoon showing you that when we're looking for, uh, for, for biomarkers, it's not just important what biomarker we're looking for, but maybe the time or place that we're looking for them. Uh, and so in the particular case here, looking for um, particular types of biomarkers such as lymphocytic infiltration uh, when patients are actually um, when, when, when patients are actually on therapy may be better than trying to use it before patients are on, are on therapy. So we're going to um, switch gears now and then quickly um, uh, give a, a very quick introduction to, uh, to, to liquid biopsies and then talk a little bit about each of these factors and whether they might be amenable to liquid biopsies as well. So this is the um, a Journal of uh, Clinical Oncology, sort of a, um, a joint uh, statement from uh, ASCO and the College of American Pathologists, sort of looking at um, sort of looking at uh, at liquid biopsies, and uh, I was one of the uh, one of the authors on this particular work. And we came up with some some definitions that I that I want to talk to you um, talk to you about now, and you know just sort of what is a liquid biopsy, and we defined it here as a minimally invasive test um, done on a sample of blood. Um, where we are looking for um, cancer cells from a tumor that are circulating uh, in the blood or fragments of, um, of tumor-derived DNA that are in the blood. And it's this latter definition of tumor-derived DNA that's in the blood uh, that's going to be relevant for our discussion here. Um, and then the concepts of, um, of, of, of pre-analytical, which I think uh, people on this call are going to be very aware of, but it's, you know, things that are involved in the collection, handling, transport, and processing, and storage of specimens that may affect the analysis. The analytical validity, which is our ability to, um, uh, to detect and measure um, with statistical significance um, a biomarker of interest um, accurately, reproducibly, and reliably. Clinical validity. Um, which is our ability to um, uh, um, divide with statistical significance one population into two or more groups on the basis of outcome, such as the presence of cancer or, uh, or a treatment response. And finally, the, 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 the highest bar for looking at the, um, uh, the usefulness of a test is, is clinical uh, utility, which is the ability to demonstrate, again, with statistical, statistical significance, improvement in the diagnosis, treatment, or management, or prevention of cancer with use of the assay compared to not using the assay. So is this assay actually useful to help us manage patients? If we think about um, comparing circulating tumor DNA assays or liquid biopsies and, and tissue assays, there's, there's a number of things that, uh, that, that, uh, that we can compare these across. But logistics, certainly with, um, with liquid biopsies, they're easier to draw. There's very little risk to, um, to venue puncture or, or, um, or a blood test. Um, and it's very easy to do serial testing, whereas with tissue assays, it's invasive. They can be challenging to, to obtain. Um, there may be some risk to the biopsy, uh, such as a pneumothorax when you're, you know, uh, biopsying a, a lung metastasis. And then serial testing is more difficult as well. Um, some of the problems from us as a, you know, um, can be that, uh, 
uh, from a biological standpoint, uh, liquid biopsies, you can't really correlate the, um, uh, the results with histology or a cellular um, a phenotype because there's not anything there to, to look at. Um, but the, one of the advantages also may be that it may represent the whole tumor or, or an averaging of all the tumors as the, as the, as the cells are you know, shed into the bloodstream. Um, but there may also be differential uh, tumor cell turnover of, of the cells that die or enter the bloodstream, and so this may also bias our, our representation. Um, however, with tissue biopsies, we know we're biased because we're only sticking the needle into or biopsying one tiny part of the, one tiny part of the tumor. Uh, but the advantage is that we can correlate the molecular results with the histology and the, and the cellular phenotype, which we can see under the microscope. Uh, in terms of uh, pre-analytical considerations, liquid biopsies are certainly easier to, um, uh, to standardize, um, uh, whereas it um, can be more challenging to, to standardize um, uh, uh, tissue assays, although the, um, uh, certainly the technology that we use to, uh, to genotype tissue assays are certainly very robust. And in terms of, uh, of, of clinical, uh, clinical utility, there's only limited, but it's certainly growing very rapidly, um, uh, clinical utility uh, for the treatment of, of advanced, uh, advanced cancer. Um, this is particularly looking at resistance mutations where there are some FDA um, approved uh, uh, products for looking at um, um, uh, the emergence of, of resistance, say, in, in, in lung cancer, uh, whereas with um, tissue assays, just because they've been around longer, we have a lot of, um, of evidence associated with um, uh, how we can use these to help manage um, uh, late-stage cancer patients. So one of the important things um, from the, uh, uh, from, from the uh, pre-analytic considerations is that we really need to understand with liquid biopsies how our collection and handling uh, procedures affect results. Um, and this is something that there's uh, certainly uh, active work going on. Uh, in terms of our analytical uh, validity, uh, we really need to understand the performance um, uh, characteristics for uh, liquid biopsy assays and how these may uh, differ between different people that, that, offer these, uh, that offer these assays. Um, in terms of interpretation uh, uh, and reporting, um, there is an expected discordance because of some of the differences that we talked about in terms of what we're measuring between uh, liquid biopsies and solid tumor biopsies and the fact that these often aren't taken even uh, contemporaneously, um, that we may see differences in terms of the types of, of, uh, of mutations that we see between tissue and, and, liquid, and liquid biopsies. And then, of course, it's um, uh, one of the other things that's important with, um, uh, with uh, the interpretation is the uh, what do you do with the clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential uh, when you see a, um, a small clone um, of say T, uh, a p53 mutation that is uh, that is present uh, in the liquid biopsies and then the finally in terms of the interpretation we have to remember that the uh, the allele frequencies or the percentage of, um, of mutated DNA that we're looking for for these assays is often very high uh, while it's very high in uh, tissue biopsies it can be very low um, to 1%, even 0.1%, or even pushing down to, um, you know, um, even lower than that, that we have to be able to reliably measure uh, and interpret with, uh, with, with liquid biopsies. So, so again, um, the uh, uh, clinical uh, validity and utility um, of liquid biopsies is, is really rapidly increasing. Again, some of the, some of the best um, uh, uses for these um, uh, have, well, with liquid biopsies, we know that when we get a particular positive result um, uh, and we know what to do with that positive result uh, from a tissue-based biopsy, that liquid biopsy is a reliable way to get the same results. And so we can sort of, um, you know, stair step from what we know works in uh, tissue-based biopsy. If we see the same type of finding in liquid biopsies, presumably it's, it's applicable. So there's, and there's lots of emerging, uh, emerging data on this now. Now there's very little uh, evidence right now for clinical utility for using liquid biopsies um, uh, to predict. Um, uh, response to immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors, uh, but one of the things that uh, that we're going to talk about uh, in the in the next slide um, is which one of the factors that we um, that we talked about there might be amenable to liquid biopsies and therefore might provide some uh, information on whether or not um, these um, uh, potential these these biomarkers are, are likely to be informative in terms of predicting response to immune checkpoint um, uh, therapy. 
So these are sort of, again, relisting all the uh, the melanoma uh, biomarkers, and I, I just want to, uh, we'll talk um, quickly on the, uh, on the uh, set of, of factors that are on the right. Um, so in terms of measuring of the uh, oncogenic pathways, if there's a mutation in this pathway, this is certainly something that we can pick up um, with, um, uh, with a liquid biopsy. So say there's a mutation uh, that we can detect in the WIMP pathway or in the PI3 kinase pathway, and, and, and that's uh, associated with, with lack of response. These things uh, may be helpful, again, using melanoma as an example. In other tumor types, there would be other examples of oncogenic pathways that are, that are effective. So these are, these are possible. These are not heavily used. Uh, clinically right now. Serum factors such as LDH are better measured other ways. The microbiome is easily accessible, uh, particularly the gut microbiome for assay. And then the um, uh, assay timing, uh, while it may be important uh, in, uh, in, in liquid biopsies, there's, there's not a lot of evidence for this now. So skipping back over now to the immune uh, microenvironment. Uh, you know, PD-L1, PD-1 and PD-L1 expression uh, and CD8 infiltrates, those are going to be very challenging to measure, I think, um, with, um, uh, with liquid biopsies. A, a thing that may be more amenable and for which there's a lot of interesting data emerging that we didn't have time to talk about is the T cell clonality. So presumably when you have a neoangiogen, there's going to be either a single or a very small number of um, potential clones that are, that are responding to that, um, that, are, that are driving the immune reaction. And so... Um, there's, there's certainly been uh, work done by a number of different groups um, looking at the um, emergence of, um, of clonality or whether you, can, uh, whether you can pick out clonality up front and predict response, um, and also whether you can um, uh, potentially um, uh, as, as, as well um, uh, predict neoantigens that, that might be um, associated with, the, um, with this T cell clonality. I think the place where, uh, where we're likely to see the, the biggest bang for our, for our buck with liquid biopsies um, is, and this is, although this will be challenging, is with um, a total mutational load, which we know to, um, uh, correlates to some degree with, with response uh, in solid tumors. And while um, you need to have a fairly sizable uh, liquid biopsy um, uh, and sequence to some depth to be able to see or estimate the tumor uh, mutational burden, uh, groups are certainly starting to, uh, to do this. And so um, the total mutational burden is, is going to be something that will be amenable to, uh, to liquid biopsy, although there are some technical challenges uh, with that. Um, there's also a, a good likelihood that, uh, that uh, we'll be able to reliably detect microsatellite instability or uh, mismatch repair deficiency um, uh, using uh, liquid biopsies, um, which is just a, you know, sort of a special case of looking at um, total mutational burden. Um, and then um, in terms of looking at copy number alterations, which may be affected by response, it's again challenging to a certain degree to pick up um, copy number um, uh, alterations, um, you know, within tumor mutational burden because of the small fraction of uh, neoplastic DNA that you're looking at uh, in tumor mutational burdens. But there, there are some there are some approaches to this that are uh, that, that are being tried. We'll have to see um, how sensitive and helpful those end up those end up being. I just want to get to my conclusions here. Um, Liquid biopsies are certainly here to stay for oncologic uh, management of advanced cancer patients. They're useful in, in multiple cancer types. We discussed mainly um, uh, cases uh, associated with melanoma. Uh, certainly late-stage oncologic management with liquid biopsies is much better established um, uh, than uh, population screening uh, and early diagnosis in cancer. Um, and these liquid biopsies are becoming a preferred method for, for documenting resistance to targeted therapies where it may be difficult to get a secondary biopsy. Um, the, the, the best use cases for, uh, for looking at immunotherapy in solid tumors is probably going to be for mutations associated with immunotherapy response, like we talked about, um, microsatellite instability, um, and total mutational, uh, total mutational burden. And in the future, we may move with liquid biopsies beyond DNA and uh, look at ways to measure and, and, and assay um, uh, RNA or, or gene expression. Uh, maybe, and maybe methylation profiles that may be interesting as well. So uh, thank you very much for your attention.